Welcome everyone. So glad you're here. Today is um, kind of a big day. I'm celebrating a big project, that one, um, finally finished. It is a publication day for my new, de my new book, uh, The Art of Tapestry Weaving. Um, thank you for coming to join my celebration and for ordering my book. I really appreciate all of the pre-orders. They were so helpful. And um, I just thank you all for your faith in me before ever seeing the inside of it. I really, I appreciate it. So today I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what's in the book and then some about the making of the book because um, it's kind of fun. Uh, if you've never written a book, um, it's kind of fun to see what's behind the scenes. And then Emily is here to help me um, field your questions because she's the best sorter of questions I have ever met. So she will um, help with that. If you do have questions while I'm talking, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button. Um, put your questions in there and Emily will sort them out and we'll talk about them in 20 to 25 minutes. So I have a little PowerPoint so you could see some images of the book and I'm going to uh, start that now. Many of you are weavers of tapestry yourself. So um, for those of you who've not tried tapestry, little tech, one more tech thing, there we go. Um, for those of you who have not tried tapestry, it's a woven structure where the warps are spaced widely so that the weft can slide down over them. In tapestry weaving, the warps are usually completely covered by the weft. And they're most often the warp is just white because you don't see it in the final tapestry. This behind me is an example of a contemporary um, tapestry woven where you're only seeing the weft yarn, which is the, usually the colored yarn. Um, tapestry is an image-based medium. The goal for most of us is to create some kind of image in cloth. Oop, sorry, y'all. Tapestry does have a long history. It's been woven for many thousands of years and it's been used to make all kinds of cloth, including uh, wall decoration. The monumental tapestries of medieval times were created by huge teams of weavers and were most often financially supported by wealthy individuals or the state or the king or someone like that. This particular tapestry is the apocalypse. It is wove, was woven in the 14th century and is currently in Angers, France. Today, most tapestry weavers um, design and weave their own work on a slightly more modest scale than that apocalypse tapestry for the most part. Um, these are two examples of my own work, a smaller piece on the left, which is 16 by 49 inches, emergent six, and then lifelines is 24 by 72 inches. And also the piece behind me is emergence seven, which is about 45 inches square. These are more of the scale of people weaving tapestry today. And some people of course weave things much smaller than this. Tapestry can be woven on large looms, like the left um, is my Harrisville rug loom. It's where I weave most of these larger pieces. And, or on the right, this is a tiny little hokit loom. Uh, it's just a little frame loom. The structure, no matter what loom you're using for tapestry is the same. Let's talk just a little bit about what's in the book. The book um, came out of my teaching tapestry weaving in workshops and then online. It's 308 pages and it covers all the basic tapestry techniques. It's broken up into two main sections, uh, learning and making. The first part of the book contains all the information you need about equipment, materials, set, and some basic color theory to help you choose yarns. This part is really targeted at people who are new to tapestry. The second part of the book is all about tapestry techniques. 
It includes descriptions and practice sections of all of the standard tapestry techniques, as well as a chapter about designing and some finishing information. The book begins with an introduction about why you might want to weave tapestry and a bit about how to be a beginning tapestry weaver. I find that a lot of us who are trying to learn a new skill as adults get discouraged easily. And throughout the book, I encourage you to experiment and realize that you cannot possibly be perfect until you practice. As adults, so many of us are just used to being good at the things we're good at. And so starting something new can be challenging. And so this is a good challenge for all of us. I think if you like to dive into tapestry, I think this book will help support that wish. One of the things I worked the hardest at in creating this book was making teaching spreads that were easy to understand and follow. There are photos and text to go with each step in each practice sequence. So I'll have a text, numbered text steps to go through when you're practicing a sequence. And then the important pieces will have an accompanying image showing you exactly how to do that thing that I've written out in text. This is really great for beginners, of course, because you can follow through step by step. But it's also a nice reference for people who just need a refresher about how to do a particular technique. This is another example from the book of a spread that's a section opener about eccentric outlining. Uh, it just shows you sort of how each section starts. I have um, a sample there of my own weaving and a description about eccentric outlines. And then on the next page, there's those step-by-step -step instructions of how to manage outlines and why you might do them. I also wanted to note that on the left side of the page, there's a couple examples of um, tapestries by contemporary tapestry artists. I have these throughout the book and they were quite important to me actually um, for both inspiration, but also instruction. The two on the left-hand page are by Sylvia Hayden and Connie Lippert. The idea for the book. Um, I've been teaching tapestry since 2011. I started giving um, workshops in the summer and I was still working as um, a occupational therapist. It's my prior career. I worked for 17 years as an occupational therapist. And so I started, I learned about tapestry as I was working this other career. And then I um, started giving workshops in 2011. I really enjoy teaching and curriculum development. And in 2014, I decided to create an online school for tapestry weaving so that I could reach um, all the people who couldn't attend those workshops in person. Also, it was partly because I was still working. And so I wanted to reach these people in a way that I could do from, you know, home while working instead of I couldn't travel because I was working, you know, during the week. So um, it actually went so well starting in, I think I launched the class in April or May of 2014. It went so well that I never went back to occupational therapy. I now have had a few thousand people work through the online classes. And through all of that online teaching, I realized that there was not a basic tapestry techniques core, uh, book out there that was updated and modern. There are some fantastic old standards and I'm thinking of the Nancy Harvey book and the Carol Russell book. Those are beautiful books and we've all had them for a very long time. Um, couple decades. There's also some shorter books and pamphlets and other things people have put out there, but there wasn't a full length tapestry book um, and there hasn't been one in almost 20 years. So I was interested in putting together this length, this book as a reference for students of tapestry, like beginners to get into tapestry and also um, I'm really interested in keeping tapestry alive as a viable art form. I think that books are really important in terms of keeping um, something like this alive. So another reason to write a big book. Story Publishing really believed in the, my concept for the book from the beginning and it wasn't long before I had a contract and two editors. Story Publishing, by the way, is amazing. They are a fantastic company and I recommend 
you check out more of their books. Um, I'm not just saying that, really, they are fantastic. Um, they were really great to work with. So writing the book, right? So I still have to write the book after you get a contract. Um, I first started, when I first started writing the book, I was pretty overwhelmed. I There was just so much content that I wanted to include. And after a few months of really struggling with just pages and pages of notes and where am I going to put all of these things, um, I went to sticky notes. Someone suggested sticky notes and it turned out to be the thing for me. I was able to put, you know, an overarching concept on each sticky note. And I put up these two huge bulletin boards in my office and I could move the notes around and eventually came up with a grouping that I liked. And those groups became the chapters of the book. Many of the sections that I came up with did follow the outlines that I've been using for years, uh, teaching Tapestry Online, but it's interesting how the content shifted around a little bit in terms of how you teach online being a, quite a bit different than how you would teach in a book. At some point, I realized that this book was a really big project. I wanted to be, I wanted it to be a great uh, reference book and something that tapestry weavers could consult for their whole careers. And that meant that I very quickly filled my 300 page, 60,000 word limit. When I started the project, I actually thought that turning my online curriculum into a book wouldn't be that hard. I basically had it in the bag, right? I just took my handouts and put them in a Word document and I would be done. Uh, I had taught all of this information for so long that I, I really thought that just a little bit of tweaking and it, it would be not a big deal. Not so much. Um, there were days when I felt really discouraged uh, as I realized how challenging as I realized how challenging teaching tapestry weaving in book form is. When I'm teaching in a video, I can just show you. People have questions, I can just turn on the video and show them how to answer their question. Um, and I can talk and explain it while I'm doing it. In a book, you're limited to words and still images and a few diagrams, and there's not that back and forth component that you get in an, in an online class. So at some point I went to Staples and bought an easy button um, <laughs> to con uh, convince myself that I could do one task at a time and eventually I would come to the end of the writing. And actually it helped a lot. That little British, I have it set for the British voice and uh, finishing a section and hitting the easy button actually was quite, it's interesting how we can reward our own brains. June 25, 2019, I finished the manuscript. The final word count was 86,703 words. And that was a significant jump from the 60,000 word story asked for, but most of that original manuscript ended up staying in the book. So they did some miracles with um, arranging the material. I wove the samples for the book mostly on my Harrisville rug loom. That's what this is showing. I needed visuals, of course, of difficulties that people have. There's a troubleshooting section in the book and I had to weave those error, quote errors. And um, I found that weaving mistakes on purpose was actually a really interesting experience. Some of the troubleshooting examples were pretty easy to make happen in the weaving and some others were challenging. The one on the left, for example, um, is what happens when you put too much weft into your uh, weaving and it makes these ripples in the cloth. That's not too hard to make happen, but uh, the one on the right, I was trying to get some um, warp spacing issues due to weft tension. That was a little harder to make happen, I think, just because of my long practice at avoiding this problem. I just th also think that underscores the fact that different weavers struggle with different things and that um, depending on how you weave the materials you use, the loom you're using, you can have different problems than other people do. A couple of these examples I actually wove at home on different looms and shipped the loom with the example on it to story for the photo shoot. Just trying to get ahead of, of what had to be prepared for the photo shoot. And then there was a photo shoot. In September of 2019, I flew to New York 
to um, teach first and then to do the photo shoot with the crew in Massachusetts. I teach every year in Vermont, uh, except this year. And so I got to teach this lovely group of people, um, color theory, one of the last workshops I have taught since uh, COVID. And then I went down to Story, which is in North Adams, Massachusetts to do the photo shoot. From day one, the team I was working with was just fantastic. Uh, they're all so even keeled and professional, and I called them the three M's. I had Michael, who was my editor, Mars was my photographer, and you, Michael and Mars are in this picture, and then Michaela was the, cre the creative director on the project. So I got to spend two full weeks with these folks, and um, they were really fantastic. It was, it was fun. I learned a lot about book photography from doing this photo shoot. Not that I could do it myself, but uh, Mars was really an outstanding photographer and the clarity of the images as we were shooting was really fantastic. So we'd shoot a picture and then review it on the computer. So you, it was lots and lots of feedback right away of what we were getting. Um, sometimes we'd get the image we needed with just a few shots and sometimes it took 10 or even 20 tries to get what we needed because maybe there was fuzz on the fabric or a little tail was showing behind the weaving or the angle looked confusing or I messed up the setup. There were times where I set up, um, you know, an example of a weaving practice section and I got it wrong. Uh, or I could, another problem was that I couldn't get my body out of the way. So a lot of the images have my hands in the picture but the cameras between, you know, where my hands would be naturally and the loom, the cameras behind me, my body's in the way. So getting my body out of the way while still making my hands look natural was really actually quite difficult. Um, I think we managed it pretty well, but it was not an easy thing. And then lighting. So in the picture on the right, they're using white boards to bounce. There were big strobe lights, flashes, and so to to bounce the flash off onto the subject in just the right way. Um, it was amazing how it could change just by moving where those boards were. The camera was connected directly to a computer, networked computer. And so we, you know, he, Mars would take the shot and then we would right away be able to look at the image that came up and then make adjustments. And I'm not sure how you ever could have done a photo shoot like this before digital photography. I just, um, would have been a very different book <laughs> or a very much longer photo shoot. And then in the image on the right, that's Michaela, um, the creative director arranging backdrops for the next image. So the book was all planned ahead of time. And her job was to figure out the colors and the styling and the layout of the book. And so she had all of this worked out beforehand and um, would shoot, you know, depending on what chapter we were shooting photos for, she would have a color scheme or a, um, you know, a different tabletop or something to make the pictures all look cohesive. So that's another big plus, I think, of working with this company is that they they have someone who is styling the book as we were doing the photo shoot. And it was really um, a fun process to be involved in. This is the dreaded spreadsheet. There were over 500 images in this book, um, images or illustrations. And so, um, we were working off of this big spreadsheet and I would highlight it in pink when we were finished with a um, image. And sometimes I would cheer because some of them were hard, but um, yeah, this spreadsheet was sort of our life for two weeks. And then, um, so I'd go all day long in the photo shoot, which could be eight hours or nine hours or 10 hours after I had talked to my editor about what we were gonna do the next day. And then I'd go back to whatever hotel I was staying at. And I think I stayed in, oh my gosh, I don't know, 10 different places over two weeks. <laughs> anyway, I um, would weave at night. So this image on the right is uh, one of the very last nights I was there. I was so tired. I don't think I've quite ever been so tired. And I'm trying to weave an image of um, something that we're demonstrating something on a copper pipe loom and we needed a tapestry on this loom. And I'm watching The Hobbit to try to stay awake while I'm weaving this. 
it turned out that this is the weaving that ended up on the cover, which I think is really funny because um, I was exhausted and there are lots of technical errors in this piece. And, um, you know, it, I, it turned out being a really great example of something that you could weave. If you work through the book, you'd, you'd be able to weave something like this by the time you got to the end of it. And um, so I, I liked that it ended up on the cover eventually, but when they first proposed it, I thought, oh gosh. Um, anyway, the end of the first week, we went up to Harrisville Designs, which is in New Hampshire. It's a couple of hours from North Adams, Massachusetts, to do a day of photo shoots um, of shooting photos for um, just some extra creative images. And these did end up being some of the most beautiful, creative, rich photos in the book. And there are lots of them at Harrisville. If you're flipping through the book and you see some beautiful picture of yarn or something. Um, Mars probably took that at Harrisville. They also took the um, author photo at Harrisville. That's um, Harrisville Highland behind me on those shelves in there. Um, if you've been to Harrisville, they have a teaching room on the second floor above their shop and they have this beautiful wall that's all Harrisville Highland and it's uh, in cones. It's very pretty. Here's Mars taking a couple images. And I think the images he's taking here are ones that also ended up in the book. And then um, Nick Colony gave us a private tour of the mill. So it happened to be shut down that day. It wasn't running, which was actually nice because it, if you've ever been in a running mill, it's very noisy. So we're able to ask Nick all kinds of questions. And uh, there are quite a few photos from the mill in the book also. So then the next week, uh, back at story, uh, just a few more images of the photo shoot. I used a wide variety of looms for the photo shoot of this book for demonstration of the um, concepts. A lot of the images were taken on Mirax looms and part of that is because they stand up nicely and it's easy to take a good photo on a loom that's just standing on the table. Um, also, I use Mirax looms all the time. So it was uh, an easy thing to do. This on the left, I think is a handy woman loom. Um, I use some other peg looms and copper pipe looms. It was really important to me to represent different kinds of equipment in the photo shoot in the book. Um, just because there's such a variety of great looms out there in the world. And I just want people to understand that you can weave tapestry on a lot of different kinds of equipment. I. Um, I do kind of wish there were more pictures on floor looms in the book. There are a, a few that were given to us by other tapestry weavers. But um, thanks to Tommy Scanlon, Ulrika Leander especially, you guys were awesome. Um, but I did use, um, so I used some images of floor looms from these other people. Just we had to do the photo shoot in Story's lab. And so it was um, not really gonna be the only looms I could get into their lab were jack looms that aren't good for tapestry. So um, we did it all on small looms, but know that you can weave tapestry on a larger loom and I encourage it. So the last day of the photo shoot was a Saturday. I was so relieved to make it to the last day. Um, the last day we shot just some fun images that ended up as extra images in the book. Uh, one of them is here on one of the first pages of the introduction. Uh, Michaela was telling me, I was so tired at this point. Michaela was telling me to um, turn my head and look at her and smile as, as if I was having a conversation as Mars was shooting. Um, I, I don't, it's uncomfortable for me to be photographed in this way, but uh, I think the images turned out pretty well thanks to Michaela's tips and Mars' excellent uh, photography. Also, you can see on this bench that she's pointing to is the very first tapestry I ever wove. It's actually not technically a tapestry because it's all stripes, but um, I wove that at Northern New Mexico College and I keep it under my loom now to remind myself where I started. It is a funky piece of weaving, but I wanted it in the book. And there's actually an image of it um, on a big full page uh, chapter header, uh, just so you can see where I started with tapestry weaving and know that um, the more you practice, the better it gets. So here's the team the three M's and me, um, after we finished the pit, the photo's actually blurry, I think, because we were all so tired. Um, but, and there's that tapestry again on that bench to the left with one of the last images we took. 
Uh, here's the front and back of the book. And um, the full title is The Art of Tapestry Weaving, a Complete Guide to Mastering Techniques for Making Images with Yarn. The original title had um, techniques for making pictures with yarn, which was the one thing um, I asked to be changed. The author actually doesn't have control over the title. They definitely take input from the author, but um, this final title was not mine. Uh, I like it. I think it's a good title as with that change from pictures to images, but um, that might be something that isn't known maybe that if you're working with a publisher, the publisher has control over the title and the image on the cover. Fortunately, my team did a fabulous job with both things. So just a, a couple more things about what's in the book. Um, I just wanted to highlight again that it was really important to me to have images of finished tapestries in the book from artists from around the world. Uh, we ended up with some wonderful tapestry examples which really illustrate the concepts I was talking about but also um, just inspiration for what you can do with tapestry. In the left-hand picture is a Helena Herrnmark image. Um, and then you can just see part of one of Molly Elkind's um, works is cut off there. She, um, I have a section about using collage for design and that's what that image was talking about. And then in the right picture is a Susan Martin Maffei and a Julia Mitchell uh, tapestry. There are lots of tapestry weavers who, um, gave me images for the book. Thank you all so much. Some of you I'm sure are here. Then there was the editing. I thought the book was finished after the photo shoot was done and I was totally wrong. Um, editing was pretty intense, especially after COVID interfered with Story's normal procedure. Um, the images were, the, the illustrations were done by a professional illustrator. Um, some of the, so these are mock-ups that I sent to the illustrator. Some of them were not bad, like the one on the left. Um, some of them looked like the one on the right and she did an amazing job. So any um, errors and illustrations are certainly mine. Uh, she really was a great, did a fantastic job. The illustrations in the book are very clear. I hope to get all my editing done before I went on this artist residency about a year ago now at the Lillian Smith Center, but um, I was not done. So I spent most of that residency editing the book and working on a couple last samples that were not finished. So the example on the right is um, a sample of the same cartoon woven at 12 EPI and six EPI. And then on the left, you can see that dreaded spreadsheet is there and the, I'm working on all of the um, images there that are not pink. Those are the ones that were not done. So then after that, we could get to first pages. So once the book is laid out and it's all like what it's gonna look like, um, it goes through another editing process and they call it first, second or third pages. For first pages, I actually got a printout on book paper. These are full spreads and I went through it and made corrections and sent the whole thing back to my editor. And then COVID hit and for second and third pages, I had to, um, they were not, a, they were, they're not working in their office anymore and they weren't able to send me a print manuscript. So I worked off a digital uh, manuscript and this black and white copy that I had made, which my brain works better if I can see things printed. Um, and the mirror in this image is because I was watching the Orioles at my bird feeder uh, through the window that was over my shoulder. Uh, and then finally, and rather anticlimactically, the book was finished. Uh, it was sent to the printer and I didn't see it again until my copy showed up on my doorstep in September. And I have the picture on the right, I have sandwiched my book between um, some of my other very favorite tapestry books out there, hoping that it would be accepted on the shelf of tapestry lore. So I just want to end with a little, a few thoughts about why weave tapestry. Um, for me, tapestry is about making something with my hands. It's about expressing a feeling or a thought or a belief in image form. Yarn is an addicting material, uh, at least for me, I think for many of you. Its ability to reflect light and its depth of color is something that paint just can't imitate. 
So tapestry, of course, is a fairly slow process compared to other kinds of weaving or to a medium like painting. We're creating both the cloth and the image as we work. And one of the best aspects, I think, of this practice of weaving tapestry is the way that it helps you focus on what you're doing right now, just right now. Suddenly the thought that today is election day in the US uh, fades away and we can all just be concerned with what will happen if we move a color over one warp thread or what effect adding that bright pink piece of silk to a red weft bundle might have on the form we're weaving. I fell in love with tapestry almost 20 years ago now and I wrote this book to help other people fall in love with tapestry also. This weaving is by Sarah Sweat. She wrote the wonderful foreword for this book. I think for everyone all over the world, the sentiment is important. It says, just this moment, I'm all right, you. I'd like to end by reading a few sentences from Sarah's foreword and then we'll take some questions. Sarah says, Handwoven tapestry is a demanding medium by any measure and to make it approachable to the beginning and to make it approachable at the beginning and compelling after a lifetime is Rebecca's particular skill and a gift to us all. For this medium is both timeless and utterly of our time. One of the few means of expression that cannot be replicated by machine. Our world needs more tapestries. It needs your tapestries. Just remember, this book is best commenced with a warped loom by your side. And if you don't have one yet, instructions await in chapter four. Sarah C. Sweat. Thank you, Sarah, for that beautiful um, foreword. I am so pleased that Sarah was able to jump in and work on this book with me. One last slide, um, details about, I've had a lot of emailed questions actually from people about where to buy the book. It is published by a major company and it is available everywhere books are sold. So if you have a favorite place to buy books, look there first. Um, on my website, which is tapestryweaving.com under navigation, there's a section that says books and there's a page there that has some ideas and links of where you could purchase the book if you'd like it. There's also more pictures of the inside and you can look at the table of contents more clearly. Um, Amazon, bookshop.org is a great place. Um, Amazon all over the world. I know it's shipping out in uh, Europe and Australia this month. So um, hopefully you'll be able to find a copy if you want one. All right, that is the end of our um, my presentation. And hopefully you all are still there. We had a little internet glitch this morning, which was a moment of, um, oh my, uh, maybe election day is going to <laughs> crash and burn everything, but it all came back and we're good. So um, if I disappear, I apologize. It's my internet, but so far so good. I um, have a question from Mary. Let's start with this one and then um, Emily will jump in and uh, let me know what you all are asking. Mary wants to know, is your book a good resource for weavers who are new to tapestry weaving? As in, is it beginner friendly? And I just want to assure you, Mary, that this book was written for you. I teach, um, I teach all levels of tapestry weaving, but my particular focus is on teaching beginners and people who are sort of early in their tapestry journey. And so this book was absolutely written with beginners in mind. So it starts at the beginning and assumes that you don't know a whole lot of anything, including, you know, what yarns are good and what looms are good and um, how do I put the warp on the loom? So um, that is uh, to reassure you that if you are a beginner, this book is for you. Okay. Emily, do you have more questions for me? Hi, good morning. Uh, there have been several questions. Thanks for your presentation and thanks everybody who has submitted questions. So first I want to say um, some congratulations are coming into you, Rebecca. So I hope that, that you enjoy that. Thanks everyone for, for writing in and for joining us this morning. Um, 
some people are also mentioning that their books are arriving, some from their own, you know, small bookstores. Um, and, and also the Kindle version is, someone mentioned that it's great for them from Uruguay, they're enjoying their, their Kindle version. So beyond some of that commentary, some of the hard and soft questions are these. First, the soft question. Um, it's about yarn. So how do you pick a good yarn for tapestry weaving? This is coming from Sally. So I, um, this was one of the things I really talked, I really worked at hard when I was writing the book was how do you present the idea about yarn? Because there's four gazillion kinds of yarn, right? Like how do you even know if you've never woven if you've never woven anything before, or if you've never woven tapestry, how do you know what to choose? Um, so in the book, I um, talk about anchor yarns. I call them anchor yarns because this is how I learned. Uh, my teacher used a particular yarn, which happened to be Harrisville Highland. And I um, learned through using that yarn over and over and over and over. And then as I went along, I you know, it allowed me to branch out and to understand why that yarn worked for me or didn't work and to branch out and try other yarns. So in the book, there are samples. There's an image of these four samples um, which show you how different yarns look. So a yarn like, I think this one is um, Freed. This is a Norwegian yarn. It's quite shiny. And this one, for example, is Harrisville Highland, which is quite matte in comparison. Uh, and then this one also is actually Weaver's Bazaar, which is fairly shiny. So I chose, these are actually the four anchor yarns that I chose for the book, which um, include, oh, I'm wrong. This one was Harrisville Highland. And this one is Faru, which is a Swedish yarn by Bakken's. These two yarns are somewhat similar. And then Weaver's Bazaar and um, Freed. So I give you those four places, um, four yarns as a place to start. You can start with a different yarn. The concept being you want to pick a yarn that is firmer than say a knitting yarn. You don't want it to be bouncy and you don't want it to you know, pack into nothing. If it's so full of air, it doesn't make a good tapestry yarn. Um, and then color variety. So some yarns have more color range than others. And I dye my own yarn. And so I'm a little less concerned with that, but I talk about which yarns have the most color range in the book. So that is a start. And the book actually has a chart of, of these four yarns and what to look for in other yarns. So hopefully that um, is a good start on the yarn question. Well, I could talk about yarn forever, but I'll stop there and um, you'll just start experimenting and find your own anchor yarn. Okay. Thank you. So that was the, the software question that I mentioned. There is a hardware question okay. about, about a loom. This is coming from, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Georges Lichtenstein. He's from Belgium. And he says that um, he started weaving about a month ago oh, cool. on a school frame loom. Okay. Um, and, but he's also received a rigid heddle loom as a gift. And so his question is, is, can tapestry be woven on a rigid heddle loom? I hear that question a lot. Um, basically tapestry can be woven on any loom that holds warp warps tight. I mean, that's the concept of the loom is that the warps are held tight. The thing with tapestry is that gosh, it's easier to learn if the warps are held quite tightly. So firm tension. And that means that some looms are not as good for tapestry. Um, I think the school, I don't know if you're talking about the shacked school loom, but it's a, a large peg loom. If you're using a nice, like a cotton seine twine warp, that loom works great. You just warp it tightly and um, you're good to go. The um, rigid heddle loom, I there are a few that work fairly well. Um, the ones that have a structure where there is a front and back beam and the warp goes over and wraps on another beam seem to work a little bit better than the ones that have, they just have two beams and those turn. 
because the tension just isn't very good. So if you have a rigid hetero lube that's holding a pretty good tension, absolutely you can use it for tapestry. If the tension is really floppy, it's just gonna be a lot harder to weave. You still could weave tapestry on it, but it wouldn't be my first recommendation. In the book, I talk about non-tensioned frame looms, tensioned frame looms, and then beamed looms, and you know which of those work for and, and why. And um, so looms with tensioning are, are the best, but it has to be a kind of tensioning that can really hold um, the tension tightly. So I think that's a start. And so the answer is yes and no on the rigid huddle looms. Depends on what loom it is. I think like the Shacked Cricket actually does a pretty good job of holding a tight tension, but some other rigid huddle looms just don't stand up to the, the um, force we wanna put on the <laughs> poor equipment. You don't wanna ruin your beautiful rigid huddle loom, which you can make other things on by trying to crank it up too tightly. Okay, great question. Okay, uh, another question or sort of a grouping of questions is about techniques. So what techniques do you cover in the book? And then specifically also Bonnie has asked, what is eccentric or eccentric weaving? It sounds like it's weird as in an eccentric person. I don't yes. know about the equating of you know eccentric and weird. But, um, so that is a question, what techniques are in the book and then what in the world is eccentric or eccentric weaving? Okay, great. So the book, I'm just gonna actually look at the table of contents. It's all the basic tapestry techniques um, that you would use in sort of contemporary. And this is, I guess I should say sort of European centered tapestry techniques. I grew up in the Southwestern United States. So I have a little crossover, especially with Rio Grande Hispanic weaving and Navajo weaving. Um, each of those traditions does things a little different, differently. Um, most of the stuff I'm presenting in the book comes from more of a European, French um, tapestry tradition. It's basically the conglomeration of tapestry weaving that I have seen in the United States. Um, still a great book for other places in the world because the more techniques we learn, the better. But um, it doesn't address things like tapestry from South America or Peruvian tapestry or um, even some more advanced French techniques it doesn't address in much depth. Um, the one I'm thinking of there is hachure, which I do talk about hachure, but that is a technique that is not really a beginning technique and is something to learn once you've mastered these other things. Um, but the techniques that I talk about in the book include um, lots of troubleshooting stuff. So I actually start with some of the things to watch for, like weft tension problems, um, how to fix some stuff. Heading off trouble is what the chapter is, is called, heading off trouble. So trying to present, you know, the stuff you're going to struggle with most likely, this is how to watch for it. And then I talk about hatching and um, interlocks and slits and how to make angles. And uh, pick and pick is a fun thing to do. Other ways to make vertical lines. So some techniques to help you make vertical form smoother. Um, then there's a chapter about uh, curves. There's a design chapter where I talk about um, using a cartoon. How does that work? And then outlining, which is what Bonnie's asking. So um, weaving eccentrically, and I apologize. It's, I think the word is actually eccentric. So it sounds, yeah, E-C-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. -E I come from a therapy background and we are often taught to say eccentric because there's another similar word that we're trying to differentiate between. So eccentric outlining or eccentric outlining, as most of you say, is when you build up a curve and then let's see, I bet I have a sample right here. Um, so if you built up this curve underneath, you made this shape happen before you wove the darker blue or the dark color, eccentric outlining, eccentric outlining is when you put in this dark line. It is a way to create an outline um, which is smoother than um, it would be if you wove everything horizontally and it's called eccentric because the anytime the weft goes off of the horizontal, 
that is eccentric weaving. It is um, making the weft travel non-perpendicular to the warp, which will tend to pull the warps out of alignment. So there are a lot of tricks about how to keep your fabric nice and even um, when you're weaving that way. So hopefully that um, answered both of those questions. Thanks. As a follow-up for speaking to techniques, uh, someone has asked a more sort of theoretical and historical question about, and this may not be in the book, is there a particular technique that you believe is contributing to the evolution of tapestry? Ah. That is a really great question. I have never thought about that. I have seen, um, I don't necessarily think there would be something in my book particularly because this book is about the basics, like knowing all the foundational stuff so that you can then experiment and do whatever it is you want to do. But is there a technique that's contributing to the evolution of tapestry? I have seen some amazing things happening in tapestry in the last 10 years. There are people experimenting with pulled warps, open warps, all kinds of 3D things, people weaving in circles. There's an amazing um, tapestry artist and professor in Poland whose name I will not be able to say, but y'all know who I'm talking about. Um, I'll put notes somewhere if you want to know, um, who weaves not ne never in this flat manner like this. It's always circles and on forms. Um, so I think that kind of experimentation, um, maybe pulling tapestry off the wall is, is something that is moving it forward in terms of modern art. Um, and I'll just say that the person who wrote the forward to this book, Sarah Sweat, is experimenting with 3D off the wall tapestry in ways that are accessible and really um, useful for even new weavers. So, um, She's someone, if you're new to tapestry, that follow her blog and um, you'll get a lot of inspiration about that sort of evolution. So that's my opinion that I think there's a lot of people who take the basics and then are broadening it with some experimentation um, in non, um, you know, pulling it up, pulling tapestry off the wall. I, that's not to say that I don't think this kind of tapestry can't also be um, important and moving forward. So there are also a lot of people weaving small format and that is more accessible to a lot of people and they're learning to express things in a very simple way that you have to do when you're weaving much smaller things, unless you weave at very close sets, like um, some amazing tapestry weavers like Kathy Todd Hooker do that and um, you can do amazing things, but I'm gonna start rambling now. So hopefully that's a good start to that answer. Thanks. Well we have a, another question that, that uh, sort of envelops these ideas in a similar way. And so Linda has asked, does the book share ideas about how to come up with images? So this is a design question. And, and so does your book address the, this more ethereal issue about how do you have ideas and how do you translate that to tapestry? a fantastic question. That is a question that um, I think all of us hit sooner or later. The book is definitely focused on beginning. This is how you get in. This is the foundation. I really want people to learn the basic techniques, learn what works the best. Um, and you have to learn that. Experimentation is great and I, everyone needs to experiment, but you do have to learn some basic rules. And that's what the book is about. There is a chapter on designing and I do address different ways of designing. I talk about sort of how I like to work with materials. Like I use a lot of tracing paper when I design because I can see layers and move them around and it works for this kind of work very well for me. Um, there's some information about collage. I was, I mentioned Molly Elkind and she, there's an images of hers and some ideas about how to use collage. Um, using computers for design and a few other things. But I will say that the design ideas are fairly sketchy and that that is not a focus of the book for sure. That is a focus of 
other things like the design course that I teach online and that sort of thing. I will also say um, that Tommy Scanlon has a book coming out that is focused on how to get those ideas for tapestry. And it will be out in, I think, May from Schiffer Publishing. So that is a much anticipated book, which I, and I think it will really back up this book that I've written to have that design piece in a full length book. So great question, Linda, thank you. Um, yeah, I wish there was more room in this book for that information, but that is, you know, maybe another book down the road. Another book. Yay. Fantastic. Okay, not any time soon. I'm not doing a new book anytime soon, but down the road, I said, in a few oh, years. I, I, I'm teasing you about the, the process of writing a book, of this book in particular, because there's another question about that. And thank you for sharing like how, how bookmaking works in the modern day. It was pretty fascinating. So a question from Joan is, um, did you enjoy writing the book? And you mentioned this a little bit. Um, how did uh, teaching in person or online classes, you know, differ from like you know, the book writing and so forth? Cool. So did, did you enjoy it? <laughs> I enjoyed, I did enjoy it. The process was fascinating. Um, I mentioned several times in that talk how I thought I was done and I wasn't. And that's just a matter of being a new author. Story was really, um, I think they're very smart about this. They gave me an editor, a very experienced editor who helped me like hash out those first few months. Her name is Gwen Stieg. She's a um, fantastic editor who, um, used to work full-time for story and now she just helps people like me um, get the book ideas together. So they, she really helped me structure uh, stuff. And I enjoyed that process as hard as it is to winnow things out and organize things. I did enjoy the writing process. Um, I don't enjoy hard deadlines. And so um, they're good for me, but um, there were a few deadlines I was up against that were stressful. Um, and that's not enjoyable, but that's with any big project. Teaching in the book um, versus teaching in person, the thing, and this is um, a difference between teaching in person and teaching online also, is that when I'm teaching somebody in person, I can read, sometimes you can read how someone is doing, um, you know, cues about they're frustrated or they just don't understand something. You can read that on their face and have an opportunity to help them right there. And it's harder, a little harder online because you're relying on them actually telling you that they have an issue. If they do, then you can come back and help them um, solve that problem in sort of real, almost real time. In a book, it's one and done. I write it and I do the pictures and there's no feedback in terms of if they don't understand the way I did it, they can't come and ask me, you know, why did you, you know, what do I do? And so that was the hardest thing about writing the book, I think, is trying to think through what are people going to have difficulties with and how can I preempt that by making it as very clear as possible. Um, that was a big challenge. And um, I was fortunate to have my second editor, Michael Lumsden, um, is a fiber person, but she'd never done tapestry. So she was super helpful in terms of, we'd be working through something or even in the photo shoot, she'd be like, wait, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me in terms of she didn't really know how to weave tapestry. So she was a good test case. Um, and so that was helpful. And then to have other people like check various sections and see if they made sense. But um, I did enjoy, I did enjoy most of it, um, except for the deadlines. It was, it was a lot of fun to actually put it down and then to get the book actually in finished form was pretty amazing. So thank you. That's a great question, Joan. I have uh, one more sort of cluster of questions and um, unless anyone is, is adding some more. There, a couple of questions have come through. And so this is a good reference for beginning weavers and it's a good reference for having, you know, visualizations of techniques if you need a refresher. But, but some uh, attendees today have asked, will you write a book that addresses more advanced 
techniques that are not in the current book? That is um, a great question. I would love to do that. Um, like I said a minute ago, writing another book right now is not happening <laughs> because uh, it's a really, it's a big thing. You put, you basically put a whole lot of your life on hold for more than a year, a couple of years to write a book like this. So um, it won't be soon, but I do think that having a follow-up book with more advanced techniques would be really fun. And I don't know if I would mix that with um, some design information or how I would do that. But there are things that I don't cover in depth, like how to do transparency and sort of some color work and then other more advanced techniques. I mentioned Hachor, um, which I would probably need to get a French trained weaver to um, partner with me to teach that at all. Um, and, and some other, you know, bringing some of the other techniques together into, it's that thing where you know how to weave the techniques and you can weave a sampler, but you're not really sure how to use them. And so that was part of the reason why I had so many images of tapestries in the book, because I wanted you to be able to say, oh, we're learning pick and pick and we're just weaving a rectangle of pick and pick, but wait a minute, this tapestry artist used it like this in their piece as maybe a shadow or something like that. And maybe I could do that too. So um, I started doing that on a sort of beginner level in this book. And that would be something that would be fun to explore more in depth at in, an, in another book. So I'd like to point out to you, Rebecca, a lot of people are offering not just their congratulations at the culmination of the book, but, but their thanks for um, putting, putting a new volume out there in the world. Um, Thank you. Guys. A couple of, of other small questions and perhaps, the, you know, these are quick ones, but going back to techniques, um, is there, do you cover Hill and Valley in this book? And also, um, there's a question about, and forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, Krapod. Uh -huh. um, and it, so are those also included here? Yes, definitely. Um, I spent a long time working on the Hill and Valley and the angle section. So the Hill and Valley stuff is encompassed in the angle section. And those of you in my Warp and Weft online class have just seen the new material that actually grew out of writing the book where I revisited that whole um, concept of how to teach um, angles plus um, hill and valley threads, which also works, you know, is important for other forms also. But um, yes, I definitely cover that in a fair a fair amount of depth in terms of how to utilize the concept to make um, smooth or, or bumpy, you know, what, how you would make a line look a particular way in tapestry using hill and valley. And then crapaud or crapaud is the French word that, um, I think it literally means little frog. My teacher used to call, say it meant crap. Um, <laughs> what it actually means is that you're just putting in an extra piece of weft to shift the shed. One of the most challenging things for new weavers is that you are always feeling like your sheds are wrong, um, that you're, it won't weave because you're in the wrong shed. So I do talk about that and using an extra piece of weft or a crapaud or a crapaud um, is one way to shift the shed. And I use it all the time. Um, I have been using it a lot lately on the Change the Shed broadcast that I do on YouTube. So there's another place to see me actually weaving um, that in real time if you're interested. Um, did I hit it there? Did I, did I address that question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> the, so we're right at an hour now and um, I've been able to cluster some questions together for you. Are there, is there anything else about the book process um, or the book itself that you would like to, to share with us? I just want to express my gratitude to everyone for pre-ordering. So many of you who know me jumped right in and pre-ordered the book. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the life of a book. Um, it's made it to number one in one of the categories on Amazon. And that 
just means that Amazon will will keep the book up front for a long time. And that's um, important to me. Story is also the other reason I love this publisher is that they're really committed to keeping their books in print. So I'm hoping that you will still find this book in print 20 years from now. Although I do hope that somebody else has written a new updated and modern tapestry technique books in, in 20 years. Probably not me, but maybe. <laughs> um, so I just, I really want to thank everybody who bought the book and all the people who supported me, the people who um, gave me the idea, like Jillian Moreno, who it was her idea that I start this thing. Um, she is a, a spinner and a knitter and an amazing person, another person to follow in line. Um, and she came up to me at a conference we were teaching at and said, you should write a book and this is the person to talk to. And so I kind of blame the whole process on Jillian, but um, thank you, Jillian, for getting me in and talking to Gwen Steeg. And, and there were a lot of other people who um, helped me along the way. There were a lot of tapestry artists who answered my questions. Um, people like Elizabeth Buckley and Susan Martin Maffei and Michael Rohde and Susan, uh, Sarah Sweat. And um, gosh, there were so many people who, um, Chrissy Freeth, bunches of people who were willing to help me work through what is important to teach and what is maybe not as important for this volume. And I just wanted to, um, I'm, I'm forgetting a bunch of people. Many of them are mentioned in the acknowledgements of the book. And, um, you know, my teacher was James Kohler who passed away in 2011. And the samples of this book, um, something I forgot to say when I was doing the samples, this color in the samples, um, the blue, is actually yarn dyed by James. Uh, I got some of his yarn after he passed away. And um, I just like that he intended to do a tapestry techniques book. Um, and then he died young unexpectedly. And um, this yarn was his. And I am just happy that it is part of the samples in the book. Um, part of the color scheme of the book um, was James's yarn. So, a Huge thank you to everybody for coming and for um, supporting the book and, and those of you who bought it, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's really useful. That's the most important thing that it's a useful book um, to work through all of your tapestry explorations. And I guess that's the last thing I would say is please go explore. Um, Go do some weaving, play with stuff. If you don't like what, what you see coming off, just keep weaving. I'm telling you that the more you weave, the more you will figure out what you love and what you want to um, express. It's a great medium. It's rather addicting. And um, I hope to get many of you addicted to tapestry weaving also because it's a um, medium that needs to continue. And I think it will into the future. So thank you all so much for coming. I think we're at, yep, I've gone over my hour now. So I really appreciate it. Big celebration. To our, if I had like balloons to drop, I would totally have done that. But um, no balloons and confetti is just something you have to vacuum. So no confetti either. But thank you all for coming. And um, I will see all of you online, I'm sure. Have a wonderful day and um, happy weaving. <laughs>